So welcome everyone to our Stories That Inspire series for, as part of Bristol's Women's Center. And today we're very excited to have Justina Perry. We're gonna have her speak in a few moments, but beforehand, I'm gonna share a little bit about the Women's Center. My name is Eva Brito and I am the director of the Women's Center here at Bristol Community College. We're very fortunate to have a Women's Center at our community college campus, one in three within the Commonwealth. And if you're not sure what the Women's Center is, it's a safe place and a supportive place for all students, regardless of the name, we're very inclusive. And we really try to provide a place of empowerment and advocacy and looking at the intersections that exist within gender and making um, spaces where we can discuss those intersectionality with race and gender and class and all the isms that exist and provide resources and support for our students within the classroom, outside of the classroom with different workshops, lectures and seminars. And this is one of the ways we do that by providing stories of women that have been influential in supporting our communities in different ways. And I also will take this opportunity just to let you know about some of the events that are coming up within the Women's Center because although we are virtual, we are still very active in supporting our students. Um, we are very excited this year that we were recently awarded a, um, a grant along with the Multicultural Center and we're going to be starting a program in the spring called Parenting Advancement Pathways, and which is a unique and innovative program exclusively designed to support parenting students with wraparound supports and we know better than ever that parenting students really need the support uh, in these new dynamics that we live in. We also uh, are excited about an event tomorrow. Here at the college, we have an event called uh, Family Night in which we invite the community of all different backgrounds to learn a little bit more about the college and what we offer. And we're gonna have the first one called um, Woman of Color Family Night that we're gonna focus on that population of women and see how we can support them as a college. We're very inclusive of all ethnicities and all backgrounds, but everyone has a different experience. So how do we best understand those experiences and support them in that process. You can learn about women of color. We're gonna have a panel with our Dean Shanna Howell, as well as two, one current student and two um, other students. One of our students is actually a, the student trustee for the college, um, Alexis. And um, excuse me, I'm a student trustee, yes. <laughs> um, and Alexis Rivera's Franco, she's gonna be on the panel. Katrina James, she's a current student, also an athlete for the college. And then Viviana, also known as Vivi Gozman, is gonna speak and she was our valedictorian for 2020. So it's a very exciting panel. If you're free tomorrow, October 1st at 6.30, we will be doing that for the college. We also offer a lot of different programs. We're gonna do a program focused on Native American history um, event with one of our professors at the college, uh, Robin Worthington, that teaches a women's history course, and that's gonna be November 5th. Um, I won't go into all the details, but know that we're here. Uh, we have a parenting club to support students, and we're always um, available to support students in various ways, and you can always reach out to me as part of that. But for today, we have a, our series with Stories as Inspire, and we have a very interesting story of a woman that has created a lot of change recently with being the creating our own entrepreneurship, support Black-owned businesses in New Bedford, and it's also a physical therapist. I won't share more because this is her chance to tell her story. So everyone help me in uh, welcoming Justina Perry. All right. Thank you so much, Eva. I'm grateful to be here. and talk a little bit about myself. And I think I'm, I'm gonna focus more on like my educational journey and then as well as um, starting the uh, Black Owned Business Directory. So I'm a lifelong New Bedford resident. I grew up in New Bedford. I um, grew up with a mom, dad, a sister. I went to New Bedford Public Schools. Um, I, I did well in school and I, I knew I would go to college. That was something I, I knew I wanted to do. Um, and I, I liked science and um, I, I, I knew I wanted to be a physical therapist from the time I was in high school. My mom um, worked as a nurse and, and she, she was like, physical therapists, they like, that's a great job. They get paid better than nurses and um, you know, we looked into like, they have a really great job outlook. And um, so 
I, I was interested in physical therapy from that time. And then um, at New Bedford High, they offered um, a program for seniors to, you could leave school early to either take a college course at UMass Dartmouth, you could do um, an internship or, or work. So I, I did take a class, I took like Psych 101 at UMass Dartmouth my senior year, so that was my first exposure to taking a college class, and then I did an internship, a physical therapy internship in an outpatient clinic, and I really liked that, so I um, continued my, my interest and my pursuit of a, a PT education. And then when it came time to apply for schools, I, um, I toured a couple of schools. I, I wish I toured more schools. That, that's something that um, I think was, was like a mistake on my part. I wish I had sought out more schools, but um, the state school that did offer physical therapy was UMass Bowl. So that was the only one that offered that. And um, I was accepted there and I, I enrolled. So um, what I found at UMass Lowell was it was a big commuter school. So um, and also um, I had I had a um, it was like a, a good thing and a bad thing that my roommate was a, a friend of mine from from school that I already knew. So she was a great roommate and um, she would she would go home on the weekends. So if I ever wanted to go home, I could hitch a ride with her. But um, it kind of made for like, you know, a little bit like of a lonely first year experience. And I ended up deciding I wanted to transfer. Um, just wasn't really like immersed in the campus life there um, where it seems like a lot of commuters were there. So um, I applied to a couple of different schools. I remember making like a pro cons list. I still have the list. And one of the cons was like, it would be like I failed. Like I was afraid that saying that I didn't like the school or transferring would be like, like looked as as a failure. So um, I ultimately, I transferred, I went to UMass Amherst and um, I majored in kinesiology. It might've had something to do with a boy at the time, but I mean, when, when I got to school, we broke up. So I got, I went to UMass, um, Amherst and um, I knew like things that would um, help like my resume for applying to PT school so I I, um, I worked in a research lab I had an internship at the in the school gym I worked as a, a, a personal trainer and um, my grade my GPA wasn't really competitive I worked a lot when I was in school um, like to make money I worked also so um, and there was a lot of fun things to do. So sometimes I would be distracted from school, honestly. And um, for applying to PT school, I knew I needed to have like a really good GRE score. So I enrolled in um, a GRE prep course and I did that the summer before senior year. And um, I applied to like six or seven PT programs, like grad programs within New England. And I actually, I got an interview at one and I was accepted to one. So I, um, I went to, um, I went to Simmons College after that. Um, that was all I, yeah, so um, this was a different experience for me. It was my first time at a predominantly white institution. I had always gone to public school. It was an all women's school, so that was different and just a very different nature of um, like of I needed to really be applied to, to school. And I remember like some things I do remember about this time were like um, the first day at orientation, we were having a tour by one of the orientation leaders and I was like a little bit nervous to ask this, but I asked her, I was like, oh, you know, can, um, do you, do people usually work while they're in, in school? And she was like, no, she's like, you, you just do school. You know, there's no, like, there's no time for work. So, I mean, at this point I had already committed to my summer job at the time, which was, I worked at the radio station, local radio station, and I would do that on the weekends. Um, 
and then I also remember like my first day of grad school um, at orientation, sitting next to one of my peers and introducing ourselves. And, um, you know, I, I'm telling her, I just graduated like a month ago, you know, and she's like, oh, wow. She's like, I, I could never have gone right from undergrad to grad school. She's like, I was still in my party phase. She took a few year, few years off in between, so I remember hearing that and like, wow, this is this is like another another level of dedication that is expected right now. So um, the first class was um, it was a summer course. It was um, gross anatomy. It was human cadaver lab. So what that is is just a lot of memorization and then a lot of dissecting. Um, in a lab. So um, I, I also remember like there, the first weekend of grad school, I had a family, family wedding to go to. So my group that I was working with, um, they were, they were like prepared to stay all weekend and study. And I'm like, well, what are you guys doing this weekend? And they're like, you know, studying for the test on Monday. And I'm like, well, I'm gonna go out of town and go to a wedding. So well, I, I get back from my fun weekends and hung over and take my test and you have to get an 83 to pass. That's, that was the qualification. So I was not close. What I needed to do for the rest of the course would have been to get an A on everything. So, I mean, I buckled down after that, but it was, it was pretty, it was kind of impossible. So, um, I met with the um, program coordinator and, you know, discussed my circumstances and she asked me if I, you know, maybe, maybe I needed to be tested for a learning disability. And, you know, it really, I reflected on it and it, that wasn't, that wasn't my problem. I think I was in over my head not having the study skills that I needed. I had always been fine just studying like with the TV on and, you know, I, I did, you know, well enough to partying on the weekends and then would be able to test on a Monday, but this was like a different level of like material, like a lot of material in a short time. And, um, the, <clears throat> if you, if you didn't pass that class, they would hold your spot. So, um, you couldn't move on to the next semester without passing that class. So I actually, I took a year off. And um, so during this time, like um, my, my parents were um, having a divorce, my parents were divorced and then my father was um, dying of cancer. So he was diagnosed that summer that I was taking that course and then by May he passed away. So um, when I was getting ready to go back to, like three weeks after he passed away, I go back to take the, the gross anatomy class and, you know, I'm grieving and mourning and I'm dissecting a human body. It was like, when I passed that class, I was so proud of myself because it was, it was not easy. And, um, you know, I would show up prepared and I would stay late and I met with study groups and I, you know, I had to apply myself in a, in a different way than I ever had. Um, so I also, I got an apartment in, in the city so I could be closer and, um, I didn't work that summer. So that was like, that was what I needed to do in order to pass that class in order to be able to continue through, through the rest of the three years of PT school. So, um, during PT school is like, um, half classroom and then half clinicals. So in my first year of PT school, I, um, I went to a conference in Chicago and it was for special interest groups. So, you know, all of the, the specialty, um, leaders were like, um, pediatrics or, um, athletics and pulmonary. So all of the leaders in the field are there and they're presenting on topics and research. And that's when I was even ex first exposed to what women's health physical therapy is. And um, I, was, I was really interested in that after that. And I went back to school and um, asked my instructors like, well, when are we, when are we gonna be talking about this women's health, you know? And 
um, you know, they said in the third year, we'll, you know, we'll get to that in the third year. So I requested women's health clinical. So I was able to get some exposure during my, um, during my time at Simmons. But by the time the third year came, we spent probably like a half a day on women's health. And it was very surface. It was very much like these are the problems that you could see and you could screen people for when they come in for therapy and then refer them to a specialist. And you can seek further training and mentorship. So that's, that's what I wanted to do. So um, I actually, I reached out to um, a physical therapist who was a local. I, was, I knew I wanted to live in this area. So I found, um, I found Janet Gillis, who was working for South Coast Health. And I reached, reached out to her on my own, like not through Simmons or anything, but, and I was like, oh, um, I'm, I'm a local resident. And, you know, at this time I was commuting. So um, like I have these days off from school and um, I would be interested to speak with you or shadow or you know and she she welcomed me in and um I got to shadow her for a couple of days and I was just like wow I was so impressed with like what she did and you know she was just like able to talk with women and and men about like sex and about bladder and about bowel and I'm like wow these are like you know topics that are kind of taboo but you know she she was just like so professional about it and so um, she let me shadow her a couple of times. And then after that, she was like, you know, once you graduate, contact me and we'll see, you know, if there's a job here for you. And I, I kept that in mind. Um, so I graduated in 2014. Um, throughout my school, I, I mean, I did have to start working after I passed that like super hard class. I worked, I worked as a nanny in Boston for my first year in PT school and then my other two years in school and then I continued afterwards but I, um, I cared for an elderly, an elder woman in her home as like a PCR and I actually did overnights at her home. I did three shifts a week and just made sure she was safe and fed and gave her company um, until somebody relieved me in the morning and I would drive up to Boston and um, I also, I was teaching, uh, group fitness classes. I was, I was working a, a lot. Um, so I passed and then I, um, I called up Janet and I let her know that I graduated school and she said, she, you know, she talked to her managers and they, they brought me in for an interview and, um, I was hired um, as long as I passed the boards. So then I, I sat for a board exam in October. So I prepared for that um, over like three months or so. And um, this was like around the time that I met my husband. And, um, you know, for me, dating was always like kind of a distraction. I would let that like take over what I was doing in school and stuff. But um, you know, we were both in school at the time he was starting his master's program. So we would like, we would support each other and like make time to study together, which was, was really helpful. Um, so I, I passed the board and I started working for South Coast and, um, I was, you know, just working super hard. I was working like 70 plus hours a week, you know, we were trying to buy a home and, you know, just trying to like get ahead a little bit. And um, we started our family. I, um, <clears throat> I also like in South Coast, they were um, for the hospital group, they, um, they matched me with a mentor who was doing women's health. And she actually had trained with Janet. Um, she, when she resigned after I was shadowing her for like a year or so, when she resigned, that made space for me to move into her, her role and take over her caseload. And I began taking, um, um, courses that would lead to a certification in pelvic rehab. So these courses are through an institute that, um, is, is dedicated to training pelvic rehab therapists. So I, I sat for the board for that in 2017. So that gave me a distinction and like the credentials to say, you know, this is, this is what I, I studied for. And I actually, for preparing for that exam, I worked in groups. Um, I find like that helps me to stay accountable. And um, so I, 
uh, our group is like four women and PTs who um, were, we were all practicing in different parts of the country, but we would, um, you know, like Zoom call like this once a week and we would review research and literature and um, quiz each other and prepare for, prepare for the exam. And so I was, um, once I was certified with that, you know, in, in Massachusetts, physical therapists aren't required to take continuing ed courses, but um, I think that was what's so special for me about having a mentor and in, in, um, working with Janet is because she's so, um, you know, she stays up on every current research and article and, you know, that inspires me to do that too, um, even though it's not required, but um, so, so we kind of push each other that way. And um, so the next opportunity that I had was to take a course for treating the transgender patient. And this was really important because um, for those people who are having uh, gender affirmation surgeries, they're, they're needing physical therapy postpart, um, post-surgically. And um, also for other surgical treatments that um, people may be having top surgeries, uh, different bottom surgeries. So, so I wanted to be prepared and be inclusive in my practice. So I took that course and it really opened my eyes to like so many things that, you know, we're not, it's not part of our curriculum in school. And, it, and even in my specialty certification for pelvic health, it's not, it, it wasn't covered. So this was really important for me to be part of that, um, to be part of that training. And what I did was I brought it back and shared, shared some of the knowledge that would apply to like all of our, everyone in our team, really everyone in rehab. So I was sharing that with the team, um, doing like a workshop and, um, I shared it with a couple of the different rehab teams that, uh, I work with. And one of them was, um, I remember, you know, we were talking about like pronouns and, and making people feel welcome who are LGBTQ and, um, one person in, in the group, she I means she's a PT. She's like, you know, we should have a training on this. And I'm, you know, in my head, I'm like, yeah, I just, I, I just trained everybody on it. I've just been standing here for an hour. But, um, you know, I thought about that and I'm like, yes, we should like as professionals, as healthcare providers to be able to offer the same care that a cis person would have you know, we sh we should be educated in this. It's not, it's not it's not the same for everyone. So um, I was seeing if there was some type of training that HR was doing, and um, actually, right around that time, South Coast had announced that they were going to start a diversity and inclusivity committee. So I asked if I could join that, and that was really valuable for me because we were, you know, in a in a I was. I had a seat at the table of a group that was open-minded and, and looking to make change. And um, so we were making like some really good progress and, and um, right around the time that COVID happened. Mm -hmm. So um, I actually, I got laid off and I was laid off in April and I'm home and watching these brutal murders <clears throat> of black people and you know like everybody and thinking about I'm thinking like <clears throat> how I could make a change and I, I you know I also felt guilty that I wasn't working on those things before I was like really focused on me and my family and I knew those things are, are wrong but I wasn't working on at any in any way like in the community on those things so um, I was calling you know reaching out to organizations that I was part of and, and holding them accountable trying to and um, calling legislators but um, one thing I had read around that time was that um, for one that black people were affected by COVID and, and dying at higher rates than white people. And also that black 
business owners, black businesses were failing at higher rates. They're being denied the Paycheck Protection Program. They're being denied grants at higher rates. So um, I was trying to find a list of local black owned businesses and I, I, I couldn't find anything. And I just put like a, a question out to my small network of Facebook people and um, nobody knew of anything. I mean, one person was like, you should, you should start, you should just start it. So I started just making a list of black owned businesses that I knew about that I, you know, maybe grew up going to what I patronize, like where I get my hair done and, you know, places like that. And then, um, you know, I was getting suggestions from friends and adding to the list. And then, um, Somebody that I, I used to work with at Fun 107, she reached out to me. She still, she works there. She does amazing work there. And she she was like, um, we should get this on the radio station. And, and, and we did, we put it out on the radio station and the audience grew. And um, I had moved it onto Instagram. Instagram for me was like a little bit easier to categorize the businesses that way. And um, once it was on Instagram, I had some like really talented people reach out and offer to support, offer to support without like taking, taking it over. You know, I really, um, I was enjoying managing it. And um, so some people were like, let's get you a logo, you know, let's, let's start featuring some of the businesses and getting their stories out there. So that was like completely, um, you know, supported like other volunteers. Um, I had somebody who reached out to me who was like, let, like, I can do a website for you. And I'm like, yeah, let's do that. So, and she continues to maintain the website for, for, for this platform. I decided to call it by black NB, not even thinking like we could cover like all of South coast. At first I was thinking like, you know, maybe fall river would make a list, but I mean, at this point we we're covering all the towns from Wareham to, I mean, hopefully Somerset, if they, get any black owned businesses if you know of any let me know but um yeah so it's an online directory i i'm also trying to spread awareness and to social justice issues um we raised money for the naacp this summer so actually 700 dollars just from selling t-shirts that say like buy black and be on them and um the reason why i picked naacp was because they were working on local on the, at the local level um so i think like you know although there are you know racist acts happening all over the country i mean there there is a lot of problematic things happening right in our own in our own neighborhoods in our own city so um and i was also a member of the youth council of naacp so i really wanted to i thought that was a good place to start. So we raised money for them. We got the press involved. Um, and uh, Buy Black and B was um, on like local news stations like WPRI on local radio. Um, the NPR and Cape Cod covered it. Um, Standard Times. So that was really the goal was to to make this resource really available to people who want to who want to support black business or want to discover new businesses and want to support local and try to keep the money in the city, um, in, in our towns. So there are young people that are organizing. Um, I would encourage any students, students who are watching this to, um, if there are issues that you care about, to go ahead and get engaged in your communities. Um, once you feel your power to to make a more equitable world and you find a group that shares your thoughts and, and vision, um, then you can really make change in, in the culture and um, you know, find something that you can sustain. Um, for me, I, I feel like the response has been overwhelmingly positive. There's like people who are like, like thank you so much for making this list. And um, they'll, they'll reach out and like try to like, can you connect me to this person? And um, I think it's been it's been overwhelmingly a good response, but then every now and then there's like some nasty comments, like people who just don't get it. And that just is a reminder of why this work is necessary. For me, like when I still hear things like that, I'm like, okay, well, this is why we need a list. Um, I think also being a woman in leadership is looked at a certain way 
being a black woman in leadership is looked at a certain way. Um, there are stereotypes of being an activist, whether you're a, a feminist or you're fighting for animal rights or environmentalist, change makes people uncomfortable. So um, I would also say that um, if, you're, if you're thoughtful about how you can make the world better for everyone, then, then that's, that's what's important. And for me, um, I'm a mother and this is, it's important for me to make change in my community and for it to be better for my daughter. Um, and I'm, I'm also a physical therapist. I'm also active in this, um, I'm active in my community and, um, and that's, that's what I'm working on. So I'm, I'm trying to give back to my community that, that built me. And this is, you know, New Bedford made me and now, um, I'm really happy that I can give back in this way. And um, mentorship, mentorship made me who I am. And, you know, I would, it, it's really important for me to be able to give back in that way. So um, I would encourage everyone who's a young person who's looking to organize to, um, to do that. And um, if I can take any questions, I'd be happy to do that now too. So thank you so much for listening to my story. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I know I have thoughts, but I also want to open it up to the group. Uh, we have a few more folks than when we started. Does anyone have any questions for Justina? Okay, I'd also put in the chat um, her website by Black NB. So if you haven't checked it out, I encourage you to take a look. I was just peeking at it while you were speaking too. It has um, a nice list and I kind of found out some new uh, places that I didn't know about locally, so it's great. Yeah, it's growing. I think about 120 on the list now, but it's growing. I get submissions every week, and um, yeah, I learned about a lot of businesses too. Like some of them, I I did know. Some of them I've tried since since learning about them. So I think that I mean that's the goal is to diversify where we're shopping, where we're spending our money, and um, really supporting the communities that are most vulnerable and I think that's like so much light has been shed on the fact that people of color are being um, affected way differently during times of COVID and um, also by violence. Absolutely. Many thoughts came to mind when sharing your story. Um, you may hear my son in the background. <laughs> the timing is always impe impeccable. Um, some of the thoughts, you know, I, you know, I know you prior to this conversation because you actually work as my physical therapist. And it was really refreshing to walk into the room and see another woman of color as uh, in that seat as a doctor. And that really happens unless I'm very intentional about seeking a woman of color. And I always think in the back of my brain about, you know, now we are, you know, still have a lot of work to go, but in a more just world, and that can happen more often and think about some of the subconscious um, and biases doctors may have if they're not, they don't look like me. So I think it's really um, important to have diversity in those fields um, and to have you. So is that something that, um, you know, is that something that when being a woman of color, is, is that a small space for you? Or are you able to connect with a lot of other women of color in this field? Or how has, that, how has been your experience as a woman of color in the field, that sense of diversity? Um, I'm usually the only one in the room. I don't work with other, um, I don't work with other people of color. Um, I'm trying to think, no, I don't, <laughs> I really don't. So um, I, I'm often um, thinking of maybe things that wouldn't often be brought up, I'm trying to think about including minority groups in the underserved populations. But um, you know, you mentioned those implicit biases and those are those do exist. Like even um, with physicians, there are studies that show that there's 
there there are myths in place that physicians still subscribe to that like black women have higher pain tolerances and that we have thicker skin and so so those are those are problematic things right because then we don't get the same care where our pain isn't taken as seriously it affects like infant mortality rate and um is issues about um across across healthcare really mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. And you think about a lot of the clinical trials and the information that's based, it's not a lot of times it's based on uh, white men or white women, and it's not as diverse. So that's going to impact the health care um, of individuals. So, so true. I think your story also speaks to um, the point that anyone can create change. I think sometimes you have to feel like you have to work in a field of activism or work as a sociologist to understand it, but you saw a need and you create a change on your own. So I love the fact of your story that anyone can do that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm not really, I don't really work in that world of like nonprofits. Right. And um, I definitely got some good advice from people, people who do, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to try to be open to that. Um, but yeah, this is, this was um, not something, I mean, it doesn't really connect, you would think with physical therapy, but um, just, I think being like, a community member and somebody who who lives here I, I shop here I work here I'm raising my family here so for me it's that that's why it's important I definitely want to open up the conversation to others in the room if there's anyone that has comments or questions regarding Justina's story feel free to share A quick question. Um, how are the businesses feeling about it? Are they getting more traffic? Are they seeing different people shopping? Or are they? Um... That is, that's something that I would, I would really like to track. Um, it's, it's so far not something that we've been able to measure. And um, I did like a recent, um, like a partnership with a, a very new business and he had like um, maybe 60 followers. And so we teamed up and um, I was like promoting him. I, we had to like a takeover day and he took over our social media for a day and was sharing like sharing his product. It was all about self care, which I think is like, it's just so important for like to sustain our activism, self care for like all of the new stress that, is in our world now. Um, so he took over and he was promoting self care. And um, the goal was that by next Friday, um, yeah, by this Friday, that we will have doubled his followers. So we're actually getting pretty close. And um, so far, I think, I mean, that's an opportunity to kind of kind of track our impact. I've from the businesses that I've spoken with, um, they're, they're really happy to be involved. And I'm I'm, I'm hoping that, um, that it will lead to that, yes. And I think Thank that's a, I'm, I'm not sure someone else wanted to say something. I think that's a great example of how we can create change in incremental ways because many, we're having all these different conversations regarding social justice and how we can support our different communities. And that's one way that you may not want to be at a protest or you may not be able to be in different conversations, but you can look at this list and say, well, that's, I've never been to that business owner or that particular business, let me check that out. And it's a great way to have a conversation too with someone from a different perspective and say, you know, what's been your experience and how can I support you? I know just now looking at the list, I'm like, oh, I, this is cool. I never know that this particular herbalist was in the community. Let me check her out. So I think it's a great way to really um, learn more about your community while still being intentional about it. Yes, I think so too. And that's kind of like, I think it's one of the silver linings with everything that's going on this year is that God or the universe or whoever you believe in is really pushing us to have these conversations and, and to address our part in, in the system and how, how we're upholding these systems and, and what we can do to really push things forward and be thoughtful about, thoughtful about our spending. Um, so I, I, I agree. Any other Christina, 
Well, I wanted to ask this question because I actually am a board member for One South Coast Chamber. And after I read your story, I took your story to the uh, board and I, um, you know, I asked what we were doing to include um, other businesses because we don't have, we haven't had a lot of diversity within the South Coast Chamber. And I would think that that's really most of the chambers, right? Um, and I had explained about uh, something that we had done in my former community in Iowa and how we had tried to create um, separate groups and separate chambers um, mm -hmm. as a way to help um, some businesses that were um, that didn't feel that they could get the support from the regular chamber, so to speak. So I would love to ask you, what can we do as part of one South Coast chamber to really support um, the black owned businesses and to help understand um, some of the special needs or challenges that some of our black business owners face um, in our area. Oh, I think that's such a good point. Um, so just having a counter space as black people is so, so important. So like having a, an exclusively like black chamber. I mean that I think that's a great goal. Um, I actually our new partnership. Uh, we have a new fiscal sponsorship um, through One South Coast, which um, my goal is to use that and really be able to apply for grants because we're not a nonprofit on our own. But um, to have that partnership um, is going to be uh, allowing us to do things like take donations and apply for grants. Um, you know, once I find some that are available and appropriate for us to apply to. So that's one, that's one way that um, I think One South Coast and, and Buy Black and Be will partner and, and um, be able to grow, grow the platform, right? Because right now we have no funding. It's basically like, it's a volunteer effort. Um, but I was invited to sit on this, on One South Coast, um, very new diversity committee and um i'm hoping that um by black and be you know being part of the discussion um that we'll be able to create change and um like one idea that i had was um to offer special membership benefits for black business owners um, those who are listed i think that's really important because that might be a barrier for people to join um, and, um, you know, I, I have other ideas like maybe offering some advertisement. Uh, these, these businesses may be, you know, not able to support their own advertising. That's like one way that Buy Black and Be, like we do basically free promotions, like promoting their, the sites, um, but on a, on a bigger platform, you know, having um, discounted advertising for, for Black owned businesses. I think those would be like, wonderful ways that, um, you know, maybe some, some of the chamber would be able to help. But um, so far, I'm really excited about the partnership with, with the chamber. And I, I think, I think that um, there will be some, some really great support in that partnership. Well, that's great that's to good hear. Question. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Anyone else have any thoughts before we close? If not, thank you so much, Justina, for sharing your story. I think you're an inspiration for many others and really amplifying the voices of others and the need that create change in our community. Um, thank you for um, sharing today and I'm sure we'll stay connected and you'll continue to do great things. And thank you for everyone that joined us on the call. And this is a monthly series. We are gonna have our next um, series next month on the 29th. And that's gonna be with Mary Vieira, which is, um, she's done a lot of work within the marketing field. So it'll be another great conversation. Thank you so much, Eva, for organizing this and for inviting me. And I'm, I'm really grateful to have the chance to share my story. Thank you. And thank Thanks, you, everyone. Justina. Thanks, everyone, Thanks, for your questions. Thank you. It was nice to meet you all.